please join me in welcoming Ronnie Bear. Thank you. I don't get any royalties, so that wasn't really a plug. <laughs> so I'm here to talk about Vermeer and the school of Delft. Um, Delft painters have been very important in contemporary popular imagination. I remind you of Theo, Theo Decker, Donna Tartt's protagonist in the recent Pulitzer Prize winning The Goldfinch. He discovers the work of the sublime Delft master Carol Fabricius, killed in an explosion just before the blast in the museum that will kill his mother and lead to his possession of the painting on the left. Tracy Chevalier's 1999 historical novel and subsequent film starring Scarlett Johansson imagines the life of the maid Crete, Vermeer's sometimes model, as the girl with the pearl earring on the right. Lines stretched around the block when these Maritz House paintings, including the goldfinch and the girl with the pearl earring, were on exhibition at the Frick Collection in New York City in October of 2013. This photograph, recently taken in our current exhibition, Class Distinctions, accompanied an article published in the Boston Globe about the so-called Vermeer completists, people whose life goal is to see all the painter's works. <laughs> Almost simultaneously, NPR did a story commemorating the 20th anniversary of the 1995 Vermeer exhibition at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, a landmark exhibition that was closed 19 days of its run because of blizzards and consequent government shutdowns. And this has become the thing of myth in my field where, where when, did you get to see the Vermeer show? How many times were you snowed out of Washington? That kind of thing. <clears throat> Another indication of the estimation in which Vermeer is held is the frequency of the theft of his paintings. The Gardner heist of the concert in 1990, one of 12 works stolen. The Rijksmuseum's love letter, stolen in 1971. Ken Woodhouse's The Guitar Player in 1974. And The Bite, Lady Writing a Letter with Her Maid, now in the National Gallery Dublin in 1974 and again in 1986. <laughs> All save the Gardner painting were recovered. There are relatively few paintings by Vermeer, somewhere between 34 and 37, if one accepts The Girl with a Flute, Young Woman at the Virginals, and St. Praxedis, and I wrote that on your little sheet of these kind of so-called contested paintings. This is the Procurus of 1656 in Dresden, one of only three paintings by the artist that is signed and dated. It is thought that the figure of the eloquent elegantly dressed young man at left looking out is a self-portrait, him. This is the only painted presence of the artist, unlike the myriad self-portraits produced by Rembrandt. Born in Delft in 1632, the son of a silk weaver, innkeeper, and master art dealer, he married above his station in 1653 to Katerina Bones, for whom he converted to Catholicism. They had 15 children, 11 of whom survived infancy, and he somehow managed to support them all, probably with the help of his mother-in-law, Maria Tins, painting at a rate of less than two works a year. He also benefited from the munificence of two men who avidly collected his work. One was apparently willing to pay for the right of first refusal. Peter van Rauven, who at his death owned as many as 21 paintings by the artist. The other was the master baker, Hendrik van Bouten, who owned at least three paintings by the artist, and this was likely in payment for bread debts. Delft, whose Neuekerk housed the tomb of William the Silent, and that's what I show you here on the right. He was the one who led the northern provinces in their revolt against Spain. Delft was an important market marketplace for the surrounding farm and dairy lands of southern Holland. As you see from the map on the left, it's only three miles from The Hague. In the 17th century, three miles would take 30 to 40 minutes by coach, 
or an hour to an hour and a half by trekschout or horse-drawn canal barge. And we know from the show that The Hague housed the court of the Princes of Orange. So there's a very close connection between the two centers. In fact, this small country of the Netherlands was tied together by many means of transportation. So artistic relationships among centers shouldn't be surprising, although each city tended to have its own character. The art of Delft, because of its proximity to The Hague, has also been characterized as conservative and sophisticated. The paintings produced in The Hague that are included in class distinctions are characterized by a smoothly painted surface with an attention to detail. So I show you here on the left Michiel van Mierveld's Maritz, Prince of Orange from 1607, where you see he's using the format and accoutrements in the tradition of the ruler portrait or the captain general of an army and navy, which is what he was. Jan Meitens at the right top has painted Willem van, van den Kerkhoven and his family, and this is painted in the international courtly or elegant style that was as, home, as at home in The Hague as it was elsewhere in courts of Europe. And Jan van Ravestein's Officers of the White Flag, where you see that each of the sitters is given the same amount of focus, their costumes have been carefully described, and the artist has only slightly varied their poses to relieve any hint of compositional monotony. And this pair of extremely refined portraits of Johann de la Fay and his wife Margarita was painted in Delft in 1674 by Jan Fercolia after his move to that city from Amsterdam following the French invasion of 1672. So these paintings exhibit the modish sophistication typical of taste at the time. Both costume and mise-en-scene convey the sitter's aristocratic pretensions. A mere 20 years before Fercolia's portraits, Vermeer entered Delft's Guild of St. Luke. So that's on 29 December, 1653. That means that by then he was a master painter able to sell his work in the city and take on pupils. According to guild regulations, such a master needed to have served at least six years as an apprentice, but we don't know anything about Vermeer's training. His earliest works are history paintings, that is, works with biblical, mythological, or literary subjects. This type of painting ranked highest in the hierarchy of genres because it was deemed to be the most exalted and demanding type of painting, the form most conducive to public edification. Paintings, quote, depicting the most noble movements and desires of the thoughtful man, end quote, as Samuel von Hoogstraten described them, or enlightening episodes from the Old and New Testaments which reflect the human soul. Young Vermeer, like the young Rembrandt, aspired to be a history painter. So you see here Diana and her companions, which we think is dated around 1653-54, and every art historian who's written a monograph on Vermeer slightly varies the dating of these pictures. So aside from the three dated pictures that I will indicate to you, the rest is pretty much up for grabs. I've given you the dates that appear in Walter Liedke's Complete Vermeer, which is the most recent of the monographs. So this painting, Diana and Her Companions, is a subject taken from Ovid's Metamorphoses, an enormously popular compilation of myths on the subject of change or transformation that was enjoyed greatly by the elite. It was, probably com it was probably completed shortly after he had registered as a master painter. And you see that it shows five young women at rest. They all avoid looking at one another. The only real indication of the subject is the diadem with a crescent moon, the attribute of Diana, goddess of the moon and of the hunt. And you see that diadem right here. This uh, subject also, as goddess of the hunt, also probably explains the presence of the dog. This is the only live animal in Vermeer's oeuvre, just because people love dogs. Um, 
but this doesn't depict either of the episodes recounted by Ovid. So Ovid recounts how Actaeon turned, was turned into a stag for inadvertently spying on Diana bathing, and Ovid recounts Diana discovering Callisto's pregnancy while bathing. This is neither of those uh, scenes. You see these figures are mostly clothed, and the subdued action of Diana's foot washing is perhaps meant to emphasize the goddess's chastity and purity. When the painting was cleaned and conserved in 1999 to 2000, it was discovered that the blue sky and clouds that filled the upper right section of the canvas, and I'm talking about the slide on the right now, that's how we all grew up knowing this picture, but it turns out that it could not, this, this area could not have been original because it contains Prussian blue and chrome green, and these colors were not available in Vermeer's day. This uh, restoration also showed that the canvas had been cropped approximately 12 centimeters on the right-hand side so that the whole figure of the kneeling woman would have originally appeared in the composition. It wouldn't have felt quite so cramped. So this is the restored version of the picture. This is how we see it today. And it, you know, the, the, the covering up of the sky has emphasized this idea kind of of a grotto enclosed space. The poses of Bathsheba and her elderly attendant in Rembrandt's painting of 1654 on the right show striking affinities with two of Vermeer's figures. And I'm talking about, of course, these two. So one wonders whether the young painter had seen it. The modeling of the figures with thick impasto and the application of brush strokes that adhere to the contours of the folds of the figure's garments are not unlike Rembrandt's technique. Likewise, Vermeer's use of light yellow-brown priming layer, interacting with the paint layers above it, and the subtle chiaroscuro to enhance the mood of the scene all recall Rembrandt. So the question is, how might Vermeer have known Rembrandt's work? Perhaps through the intermediary of Rembrandt's pupil, Carol Fabricius, who studied in Amsterdam with the master from about 1641 to 1643. By 1650, he was living in Delft, where he painted the now famous goldfinch. Both Fabricius and Vermeer depicted unusual moments in familial, familiar tales or unusual mythological subjects. So we just looked at how unusual Vermeer's was. An example of Fabricius is this painting in the MFA's collection called Mercury and a Glauros. It too is from Ovid's Metamorphoses, and it recounts the tale, the god Mercury falling in love with Herse, and then he offers Herse's sister a glauros, gold, to bring him to her. But Minerva didn't like the idea, and poisoned with jealousy by her, a glauros, the seated woman here, refuses, and Mercury then turns her to stone. So this is the very moment of her refusal. This is a very unusual subject. I actually don't know other depictions of it. <coughs> Fabricius's time in Delft was tragically cut short, as I mentioned briefly earlier, when he was killed by an explosion at the gunpowder warehouse situated close to his home. Egbert van der Poel's painting in the Rijksmuseum gives some impression of the devastation. It leveled almost half of the town and killed many and it also destroyed most of Fabricius's paintings. The poet and publisher Arnold Bonn wrote this tribute, quote, thus did this phoenix to our loss expire in the midst and at the height of his powers, but happily there arose out of his fire Vermeer, who masterfully trod his path, end quote. So this painting of Christ in the house of Martha and Mary in the National Gallery of Scotland is the only biblical subject known in his oeuvre. It's relatively large. It measures about 63 by 56 inches. And the subject indicates it might have been painted for a hidden Catholic church. 
Martha and Mary were construed as embodiments of the active and contemplative lives, respectively. That is, Martha was an embodiment of work and Mary of faith, and they both were necessary. Um, so that Vermeer tight, uh, com, um, presents this group as a tightly knit, carefully constructed uh, three figures. Each woman is playing her part. The figures, as you see, are set very close to the picture plane in an interior that seems to recede deeply into space. He shows us here a very fluid kind of brushwork and the emphatic contours of Mary's face, her profile set off against the white tablecloth, and the tablecloth, the table carpet that almost seems to embrace her. So this incredible profile here, and how it's set off against the white ground, and yet this table uh, cloth, the table covering, sweeps around behind her, her back and kind of envelops her. She is the one who has chosen the best path. It's an amazingly beautiful palette of reds, yellows, and blues with this striking mauve color tunic that Vermeer uses uh, that is worn by Christ. So this painting has a hushed quality that prefigures Vermeer's mature paintings and contrasts with his first genre scene that we looked at briefly earlier, that is the Procurus. So this is, as I said, a dated painting. It dates to 1656. And you see here a man who, who's groping a woman as he drops a coin into her open hand. And another woman looks on in approval. And I always found this hard to believe that that's a woman. But she is the procuress. The profession of prostitution, as we've learned in the exhibition, was dominated by poor single women who plied their trade at taverns, inns, and other public places. Such a licentious subject would have been titillating to the male connoisseur. And Vermeer would not have been the first painter to show himself as a rogue. I can think of Rembrandt with his wife Saskia uh, on his lap in an inn. Here, this young artist, uh, the spatial effects that he gives us are rather ambiguous and confusing. We can't quite tell whether you should be looking at the painting from the front or from slightly below, and the picture rests very precariously on the table edge, as though it would fall off at any moment. I'm comparing it here to the MFA's painting by Bob Buren of the Procurus, which shows how Vermeer is dependent on the work in terms of theme, format, and by that I mean the half-length large figures, and the broadly brushed execution. The Utrecht Caravagisti, of which Baburin was one, were important to the development of genre painting in the Northern Netherlands. This painting by Baburin was probably owned by Vermeer's mother-in-law, Maria Tins. It appears in the background of later works by Vermeer, including the Gardner Concert and the National Gallery uh, London Lady seating, seated at the Virginals that we'll look at uh, shortly. And actually the reason it's in the MFA's collection is because the person who used to own the painting wanted it to stay in Boston so it could be close to the Vermeer concert. So these three, I know it's very sad, um, these three early paintings by Vermeer that we've just looked at show a young artist searching for his voice. The theme of the Procurus, often accompanied by eating and drinking, was rela related in subject to so-called merry companies. These kinds of paintings were popular in the 1620s and 1630s. And I'm showing you here Antony's, Antony Palamides' son's company dancing and making music that was painted in Delft in 1632. So you see this is an almost formulaic composition with two monochromatic strips of floor and wall that provided a neutral backdrop for a wide horizontal frieze of closely spaced figures. The subject was essentially modern manners and fashions. Elegantly dressed figures shown drinking, smoking, and making music both inside as here and sometimes merry companies were held outside. 
and the practitioners of the genre were not confined to Delft. They were also painted in Amsterdam, where Peter Cotta and Willem Duister worked, in Harlem with Dirk Hals and Jan Mienza Molinar, and in Utrecht with Jakob Duck. Genre painting subjects changed with the signing of the Treaty of Munster in 1648. This brought an end to the Thirty Years' War and marked the actual independence of the Dutch Republic from Spain. So the Dutch were now free to celebrate the pleasures of peace, prosperity, and newly minted nationhood. They didn't have to act like they should party because tomorrow they would die. The home and with it the family and domesticity were prized as one of the cornerstones of this successful new republic and became a frequent subject in genre, paint, in genre paintings. Among their duties, women were trained in the practical arts to be good wives and mothers. And you see here lace making, which was a refined type of needlework, was equated with good upbringing, diligence, and industry. This is Moss's Lace Maker of 1655 in the exhibition. And the, the strong chiaroscuro, or contrast of light and dark, and the warm, dark tonalities imbue this image with an almost spiritual atmosphere. And this was something that could very well define the Dutch idea of women's place in the home and the domestic virtue that they brought to their work. The painting shows this single figure completely immersed in her undertaking, surrounded by objects that allude to her household industry and responsibility. And those objects include keys here, and a money bag here, and account books here, in addition to um, a, an ink stand. It was the world of women that most attracted Vermeer, but not Vermeer alone. The artist Gerard, Ter Gerard Terborch would exert perhaps the most important influence on Vermeer and his development of these feminine themes. Terborch was an artist of international repute. He trained in Harlem and traveled widely, including London, Italy, Spain, and Munster. And he was active in Amsterdam before settling permanently in Deventer, which is in his native Over Asel, in 1654. Vermeer and Terborg knew one another. In April of 1653, two days after Vermeer's wedding, Terborg is recorded as being in Delft, where he and Vermeer witnessed an act of surety for an army captain. So 10 years separate these paintings. On the left is Terborg's woman writing a letter. And you'll recognize the painting on the right as Vermeer's uh, lady writing in the exhibition. So 10 years separate these paintings. In both, great care has been taken in the design. Terborg's painting on the left is carefully composed, highlighting the woman's form and profile emphasizing the graceful curve of her neck and placing the blue ribbon from which her pearl earring hangs at the very center of the design. In Vermeer's, the woman, woman's head is likewise in the center of the painting, her body a perfectly stable pyramidal form. The most obvious difference is that the woman's complete concentration and absorption in her, ta in her task is what sets Terborg's what, what, what strikes us about Terborg's painting? While Vermeer's woman looks out at the viewer, this is rare in his oeuvre, and this quality has made some think that this may be a portrait rather than just a genre scene. The quality of light is also different. In Vermeer's painting, many of the surfaces and contours have a soft, diffused appearance, achieved by using semi-parent layers of paint so that strong light seems to penetrate soft objects. And by the same token, he used more opaque paint layers to show that hard objects maintain their solid contours. Vermeer here captures the delicate equilibrium between the physical stillness of a setting and the transient action of an individual within it. A poetic suggestiveness 
perhaps missing in the concentration of Cherbourg's woman in the act of writing. A yellow satin mantle with white fur trimming was listed in the inventory of Vermeer's household effects drawn up after his death in 1676. This, the small ebony box with studded decorations, and the inkwell all appear in other of Vermeer's genre paintings. 17th century Dutch painters had a repertoire of costumes and props that they retained in their own possession and used in various of their works. And then in this context, I couldn't help but think of Albert Kaup's portrait of Cornelius and Michiel Pompe van Meerdervoort with their tutor and coachman in the exhibition. Here are the mounted grandsons of a Dordrecht merchant who had bought a title and manorial estate, but despite appearances, he and consequently they were by no means noble. The rich clothing worn by the boys has little to do with actual hunting attire. It too was likely owned by Kalp and used here as studio props to contribute to the impression of their elite status. Here again, I'm showing you Terborg on the left and Vermeer on the right. The Terborg is dated around 1660 and the Vermeer around 1663-64. And coming up in Dublin, the Louvre and the National Gallery Washington will be an exhibition of high life genre paintings like these. And they're trying to figure out the chronology and who influenced whom because it's completely it, nobody has any answers, and so by doing a lot of technical work, they're trying to get to the bottom of who might have been looking at whom, and how, even though the imagery looks very similar, the way of getting at the imagery is very different. So I'm hoping they can untangle this, but in any case, we think that the Terborg slightly uh, predates the Vermeer, but you see that in both paintings, we have the toilette of an upper-class woman. Both imply that the woman depicted has an inner life, that we're witness to a private world. The absorption of the women in something outside themselves has been achieved through very different means, reflecting the artist's individual sensibility and his particular painterly genius. Ter Bork's woman at left, who stands in the center of the composition, seems lost in thought as she fingers her ring. She's in the final stages of her preparation, attended by two servants. Her reflection is shown to us in the mirror, but it's been modified, adjusted. The reflected image is a pure profile instead of the side of her head. The beautifully captured quality of her satin dress and the finery worn by the boy express her status. Expensive accoutrements on the table and the fireplace modeled on that of the Daventer Town Hall add to the sumptuousness of the interior. A frisky lap dog contributes to the bustle of activity around her. Vermeer's woman at right is placed to the side, a slight self-satisfied smile playing on her lips. Her reflected image is kept from us. Her head in profile is placed against the darker part of the wall, the area which an auto radiograph shows once had a map on it. She is alone in the process of fastening her pearl necklace and blocked from us by a chair in the immediate foreground. And this chair originally held a citron, a, a musical instrument. She wears the yellow jacket we recognize from the woman writing a letter, a Chinese vase with lid and finial, an ebony framed mirror on the side wall, a silver basin, partly obscured by the deep blue drapery, and a powder brush and ivory comb are the accoutrements on her dressing table. So they both have these very elaborate accoutrements that allude to the activity of their toilette. The biggest difference between the two paintings is the exquisite luminous light that enters from the window at left in the Vermeer, allowing for the play of light and shadow on the yellow curtain and gradations of white to gray on the back wall. Here are two paintings by Peter de Hoek you might recognize from the exhibition. 
He was another genre painter who greatly influenced Vermeer. He too lived in Delft, and his style epitomizes the so-called Delft School. As opposed to Ter Bork, who kept attention focused on figures, de Hoek carefully defined their surroundings, working them out so that they are essential to the composition, and extending them by means of glimpses into other rooms or to the outside. While these paintings give the impression of naturalism, they are, like all the paintings we're looking at, careful artistic constructs. Vermeer's Girl Asleep from about 1657 at the Met. This work is tied to de Hoek in that it gives us a view from one room into another. We've been looking at mature works by the artist, Woman Writing a Letter and Woman with a Pearl Necklace are mature works, so I wanted to go back and explore his development as a genre painter. Here you see he's not yet pers perfected perspectival recession. You see the plane of the tabletop tips forward precipitously. It was called A Drunken Girl Asleep at a Table in 1696. It, was, it came up for auction, and it appears like that in a 1696 catalog, auction catalog. And it's hard to see in the slide, but there is an overturned rumor or glass, a half full, it's hard to see, I'm sorry, a half full wine glass, but here you do see very clearly this wine jug. And the girl's collar is open in a rather indiscreet fashion. This was probably meant, this painting was probably meant to point up the undesirability of drunkenness, but in a non-narrative context. We have x-rays that show that Vermeer worked hard at refining this composition, and we learn that over and over again. Technical evidence, especially x-rays, show how hard he worked to make these perfect compositions perfect. In this case, a dog originally appeared in the doorway and a man was present in the back room. And I think here at least you can see the man with his hat here and the dog is here. By painting out these details, Vermeer made the image more ambiguous and less anecdotal. However, there is a painting here in the upper left corner and it shows a mask on the ground. This probably alludes to the idea that love requires sincerity with the mask symbolizing deceit. So the mask on the ground means that deceit has been uh, flung away and love will be sincere. I think as opposed to a drunk girl. The fact that she leans her head on her hand echoes the pose traditionally associated with melancholy. So Vermeer has created a provocative image associating drink, melancholy, and love, but has stopped short of making a specific didactic or concrete moralizing point. And we'll see that that's an important thing about his art. We'll see that over and over again. This painting called Officer and Laughing Girl is from about 1658 in the Frick Collection. And here we start to glimpse the beginnings of Vermeer's own vein of genre painting or painting from daily life. This is among the more uh, exuberant paintings by the artist. The map on the back wall is depicted in such detail that it can be identified. And remarkably bright sunlight enters the room the artist renders minute gradations of value in both the bright and the shadowed passages. And this is one of his, his genius things, that somehow he can capture every gradation of light from the very brightest to dark in, in a, a way that I don't think any other artist knows how to do. You'll also see that he's using small dots or globules of paint, which are especially apparent in the dabs of dense yellow in the stripes of the woman's sleeve. You see them here. You see them on the lion's head finial of the chair. You see it on the diamond pattern here. So that's also a very kind of um, typical thing of Vermeer's early paintings. 
but we'll see it also throughout his career as he starts to manipulate his medium. To intensify the silhouetted effect of the soldier's body against the light, the light back wall, Vermeer surprisingly uses yellow to trace the contours of his red jacket. And the vanishing point he uses to construct the room's perspective falls midway between the gazes of the two figures, activating and intensifying that crucial area of the painting. There's a heightened contrast of scale between the figures that's most remarkable, like in a wide-angle lens or a convex mirror. And indeed, experimentation with optical devices was common at this time. Vermeer may well have made use of a camera obscura. A camera obscura is Latin for darkened room, a dark room. And he, used, he probably used a camera obscura to observe certain effects. As you see in the diagram on the right, this device works on the optical principle that focused rays of light entering the room through a hole in the back wall will project an image of the source from which they derive on a wall or screen placed opposite the hole. In unfocused areas, particularly where bright lights are reflected off hard or metallic surfaces, highlights become diffused spots of light, like you see in this image. So a number of optical effects visible in the camera obscura seem to have attracted Vermeer here, namely the accentuated perspective, the heightened colors, the contrast of light and dark, and the halation of highlights. But he made creative use of it rather than tracing the image. If he had traced the image, it would have also distorted the architecture of the room. This painting in Dresden is the first of Vermeer's personal visions of women, isolated both physically and psychically from the viewer, self-engaged and absorbed. Whereas the officer in Laughing Girl is exuberant and stresses momentary action, this is quiet and restrained. She's been placed in a situation in which we expect no activity from her. Her lowered glance transforms her into a still life object. A sense of intimacy has been created by physical barriers established between the subject and viewer. And by that, I mean the table and the curtain. They're put in our way. We can't really attain her. And great attention has been paid to the way in which light falls on the objects and different materials. If you look closely, there are formal rhythms of shapes, the chair, clarifies the spatial relationship between the table and the end wall, this chair here. So that's really helping us define the space in which she is placed. Um, there's a wonderful consonance where the angle of her forearm is the same angle as the bowl of fruits, uh, the fruit still life. So there are echoes and there are clarifications the curtain hanging from a rod introduces a trompe l'oeil effect, that is to fool the eye. It seems as though it were in the viewer space, so at once it separates us from her and introduces our plane beyond which she exists. And we know from x-rays that this curtain was not part of Vermeer's original conception. Initially, there was a large painting of Cupid on the back wall. So as we've seen before, this anecdotal detail might have made the image less ambiguous. Also, and interesting to me, the, original, uh, the woman was originally situated further to the left and mostly turned from view. So this explains why her reflection in the window is full-faced. So see here? She's shown us, so originally she was facing more towards the window and it would have reflected her her full face. So again, we see the artist working to refine and perfect his composition. This is Vermeer's Milkmaid from about 50, 1658 to 60 in the Rijksmuseum, and it's a further step towards greater concentration and simplicity. It depicts the simplest of daily chores. 
you have this very direct and bold silhouette of a woman against a bare white wall. And like we saw with Officer and Laughing Girl, the contour of her back is reinforced with now a thin white line, which heightens the contrast of the figure against the wall and intensifies the strong earthy colors. Here Vermeer has used comparatively rough modeling, a vigorous bold brushwork that suggests that Vermeer varied his brushwork to suit the kind and type of figure he depicts. That is, the milkmaid belongs to a less elevated social class than his usual female subjects, so she's painted in a rougher, bolder manner. Indeed, it was called, quote, powerfully painted, end quote, when it was sold in 1701. She's depicted from below as, a, as if we're looking up at her, so there's a, this image is somewhat monumentalized because of that point of view. And Vermeer has located the point of his one-point perspective just above the servant's right hand. And in fact, the pinhole can still be seen with the naked eye when you look at the picture. And if you look really carefully at many of these pictures, you will be able to find the pinhole from which he has uh, cre he has created his orthogonals by um, attaching a string to the pinhole and putting chalk on the string and then putting that against the canvas which traces out the orthogonal so that he can construct his perspective. But even so, he chose to modify the perspective of the table's right edge so that it wasn't too large and didn't thereby detract from our focus on the maidservant. The textures and the materials in this painting are wonderfully rendered, where you have this gleaming reflective black brass pot hanging on the wall, and even the wall itself, with its many nicks and scratches and cracks, and even an illusionistic nail. All of this has been very carefully plotted and rendered. The glow of the light, the absorption of the figure in her task, the frozen moment of pouring, all give this image a timeless quality. It has, I've said it's been, it was roughly painted, but it's also, the paint uh, layers are very complex. The bread, for instance, has been painted in three layers. The lowest one is a thick, lumpy layer of white lead over which Vermeer applied a thin reddish glaze, and this thin reddish glaze allows the peaks of the lumps from the lower layer to protrude in the form of white dots. So he didn't paint a lower layer and went back in and put the dots in. The dots are coming up from below. And finally, he added more highlights with small dots of whitish yellow paint on top of the red glaze. So you have the under layer, you have the glaze, and then you have the layer on top. These many so-called pointillés do not indicate camera obscura effects, though, because they wouldn't have emanated from non-reflective surfaces. So a bread, if you looked at bread in a camera obscura, it would not have those halations. These paintings are nearly contemporary works. The one on the left is De Hoek's Woman Drinking with Two Men, and the one on the right is Vermeer's Glass of Wine in Berlin. This is one of the clearest demonstrations of how Vermeer responded to the achievements of another artist. The painting on the right is probably slightly later than The Milkmaid, but retains the placement of the figures in the middle ground in the corner of a room with our visual access blocked by a table. The similarities to the de Hoke on the left include the subject of a woman drinking in the company of a man or men in spacious surroundings, one outside, one inside, with the figure set back in space and the laws of linear perspective in play. Although again, Vermeer modifies the perspective. Um, it's not quite right in the case of the floor tiles and the acutely angled shapes of the table and bench uh, against the wall. There's an element of ambiguity in Vermeer totally missing into Hoke's more jovial company, even down to the man's costume in the Vermeer. Vermeer's interior is more elegant. The figures are well-dressed, the table's covered with an elaborate rug. The window contains a coat of arms featuring the personification of temperance, 
Temperance was associated with moderation or restraint and was perhaps a commentary on the woman's drinking. And the landscape painting on the back wall has a gilded auricular frame. So it seems that with all of these details that elevate the subject, that he's translating de Hoek's type of genre painting to a form more appropriate to a higher social class. He also apparently felt that a refined subject called for a fine technique. And here the clothes and faces of the figures are very smoothly and carefully painted, especially in comparison with the figure of the milkmaid. He's not, of course, the only artist who modified his technique to suit his subject. And I show you here the MFA's Jan Stain on the left of Twelfth Night Feast. And I compare it, as I do in the hanging in the gallery, to Stain's Sacrifice of Iphigenia from a private collection. Um, and I, I draw your attention to the similarities in composition, where you have this figure turned three seated and turned three quarters. You have a figure with her back to us, a child running out of the picture plane. So he's using very similar compositional schema, but in the one on the left, he's using less expensive ochre colors that are more suitable to a genre subject, and it's painted in a broader manner, and the one on the right is in his most fine painterly technique with very expensive colors as befits a history painting. So we talked about the difference in, in the hierarchy between a history painting and a genre picture. So on the left is Vermeer's painting known as Stracha, the little street, and the painting on the right is de Hoek's interior of a courtyard in Delft, which we looked at briefly earlier and which is in our exhibition. So de Hoek was among the first to capitalize on the potential of ordinary exterior scenes, streets, and courtyards in bright daylight. He depicts them like his interiors as highly ordered enclosures, relieved by vistas down a pathway or through a gate or door. Instead of the box-like construction of spatial compartments in the de Hoek, Vermeer on the left depicts a continuous wall pierced by an occasional doorway. So Vermeer has given us a very carefully planned composition, despite the impression of a fleeting moment of daily life. We know he adjusted the position of the small figures, arranging them like so many musical notes on a page. And you see here, he's really the calligraphic rhythm he creates in his paintings of brick and glass leading and the rutted cobblestone street running the length of the foreground. The buildings here are cropped at both left and right, which contributes to the momentary quality of the work. We feel like we've just come upon this kind of slice of daily life. Um, but the architecture is actually impossible. The right-hand green shutter couldn't be opening, couldn't be opened without obstructing the front doorway. And look how completely close to the edge this, this window is to the edge of the building. Uh, if, the, if the side wall were that narrow, the house probably couldn't stand. So we see that he is playing with all of the artistic means at his disposal. And he's adjusting actual things that he's seeing. It seems that this, this building is actually part of the so-called old man's home in Delft, which was a charitable institution located on the opposite side of the canal from the artist's childhood home. But it certainly did not look just like this. This is his great view of Delft in the Maurits house. And it's much larger in scale than its stracha to the point where it draws the viewer into its world rather than you observing its stracha as a kind of snapshot of daily life. This is a topographical view of the Schiekade located between the Rotterdam Gate with two turrets at right and the Schiedam Gate with a clock on the left. And it's viewed from across the Ski River. The tower of the Neuerkerk here which marks kind of the center of the city in Delft, um, catches the light. It looks like it's summer when the trees are in full leaf, 
Perhaps it's a Sunday. There are very few and very quiet figures in the foreground, and no frenetic activity on the boats or along the quay. So despite the topographic nature of the image, as we saw with the smaller picture, x-rays show that Vermeer made adjustments to the rooftops in order to compress the cityscape so that it reads like a dense frieze. Here's another example of his creative use of optical devices in that the distinctive effects of light, color, atmosphere, and diffusion of highlights along the far shore belong to the image of a camera obscura, but the highlights which appear on the side of the boat would not be visible in a camera obscura since the boat is in shadow rather than in sunlight. So again, this is another example of him having experienced um, this experimentation with optic optical devices was, was with everyone. It wasn't just with Delft and it wasn't just with Vermeer, but it's the way they make ex uh, expressive use of it that's so interesting to us. So he's used the type of highlights he observed in the camera obscura to suggest the flickering of reflections off the water. The effect of this painting has been called almost photographic. Many of you will know it as the one described by Proust. But by putting so much texture onto the surface of his work, the painter did not disguise the fact that this image is paint applied to a two-dimensional plane that is a depiction of nature, not nature itself. The music lesson in Buckingham Palace, some of you may know this painting as the one featured in Tim's Vermeer where we have a man in elegant dress who watches a young woman playing the virginal. It's called the music lesson, but it's probably a gentleman's suitor listening to a woman making music. On the virginal cover are the words, music, companion of joy, balm for sorrow. And this exact inscription occurs on two surviving 17th century virginals. These were made by the Rutgers family uh, in Antwerp, and they were the best um, makers of virginals in Europe. The painting conveys the idea of harmony inherent in music making, but the emphasis here is more on the environment than on a specific narrative. The sharply receding perspective makes the room look larger than it probably was, there's an abrupt contrast in scale between the table and still life in the foreground and the figures in the background. In a sense, it kind of takes you back to the officer and laughing girl. And all the orthogonal lines converge on the lady's lemon yellow jacket, precisely on her left sleeve. And again, the pinhole is visible at the approximate site of her elbow. So this is a, quite an amazingly asymmetrical arrangement for a painting and a very unusual composition. If you look at the tilted mirror, it reveals the woman's face, making her accessible to the viewer, but it also shows the bottom of the artist's easel here. Whoops. Here, so as I told you, that, that uh, painting of the Procurus is Vermeer's only so-called self-portrait, but this is kind of a, a disguised self-portrait. This implies that he was there. It's an artistic conceit, implying that he was the maker of this image. We see again Vermeer's great technical prowess in capturing differences in materials. Look at the nubby quality of the weave of the carpet at the table's edge, achieved by alternating layers of thick, denser paint with thinner layers. The specular reflections on the silver platter and the white pitcher, made up of smooth strokes of lead white paint that appears in other of Vermeer's paintings. And I've also included a very similar picture on the middle class table in the last room of class distinctions. Vermeer has so carefully constructed the space, created the sense of texture in objects, and naturalistically rendered light effects that the viewer feels immediately drawn into this world of luxury and privilege. 
This is woman holding a balance from about 1662 to 64 in the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And it's another example of Vermeer's ability to construct an image in which the figure and its surroundings visually and psychologically reinforce one another. It's one of his many immobile women caught in an instant of suspended attention. So just think back to the woman um, putting on her pearl necklace. I suspect that she's pregnant. This is a very rare thing in 17th century Dutch paintings. You see very, very few pregnant women. Um, the style of the dress in the early 1660s usually emphasized a slenderer silhouette, but there are some people who don't believe that they would, that Vermeer would show a pregnant woman. Um, the pan, as you see, the pans of her scales are in perfect balance and probably empty, so this is a still moment of equilibrium. Her action actually recalls the theme of the Last Judgment depicted in the painting on the back wall. You see here Christ in majesty and the, um, the results of the Last Judgment be that she's perfectly between. So this might allude to her responsibility to weigh and balance her own actions with the mirror functioning as a symbol of self-knowledge thus extolling a life of temperance and balanced judgment, but it has also been interpreted as an allegory of truth or conscience. Another interpretation uh, centers on her pregnancy. The woman has been positioned between the saved and the damned in the last judgment painting behind her with her unborn infant still in a theologically neutral state. So, all I want to say here is, because you know that I, I tend to under-interpret uh, rather than over-interpret, but I think the intention is ambiguous. I think he doesn't want us to say this equals this, this means this. It's yet another example of the multivalent aspect of Vermeer's work. What I find amazing is the light and how it's filtered through the orange curtain, and it falls with most force on the woman. The composition is dominated by verticals and horizontals, lending it a structure that echoes the woman's serenity and the care with which he placed his figures, the subtle shifts of light, perspective, proportion, and scale that he created to bind elements of his compositions together, distinguish his paintings from those of his contemporaries. I want you to compare Vermeer's painting to de Hoek's Goldwayer of about 1664 on the right. This is probably an example of de Hoek being inspired by Vermeer rather than the other way around. And you'll see there are many similarities. But de Hoek's woman is not gazing at her scales. Rather, she's active. She's placing what appears to be a gold coin or weight into one of the pans of the scales. This activity separates her from rather than unites her with the rhythms and structure of the room. This woman in blue reading a letter from the Rijksmuseum is a small painting. It's about 18 and a half by 15 and a half inches, as opposed to the earlier painting in Dresden we looked at, which measures 32 and three quarter by 25 and a half inches. So it's quite a different scale. The physical impediments and illusionistic construction have been removed, but the woman in blue is still psychologically distant from the viewer. Like the woman holding a balance, Vermeer paints another pregnant woman. Remarkable here is the diffused light. The front of the bed jacket below her arms receives the strongest light, this time coming from an unseen window. So it's really, it falls pretty much brightest right there. The map on the back wall is the same one we saw in Officer and Laughing Girl, but here it's rendered less distinctly. The whole gives a remarkably naturalistic impression, but as usual, the composition has been carefully constructed. The space for the woman has been established as that between the two chairs. Vermeer tends to even give geometric forms to the empty spaces. And I just draw your attention just here, that this is a perfect rectangle, here too. The empty spaces have their own presence. 
and he's used here a restricted range of blue, yellow ochre, and white tones. And we see that amazing gradation of tone from light to darker on the back wall, even while the light source is not represented. X-rays show that Vermeer altered some motifs as he worked out the placement of these forms. So the map behind the woman has been extended slightly to the left. The fur trim that originally adorned her jacket and its wider form have been suppressed. So I hope you see that originally her form came out like here, and you can see the fur trim here of her jacket, and this has been moved from here to here. The map and chair against the wall cast dark blue shadows, but the woman casts no shadow at all. This is what seems to give the image its timelessness. Although those who tend to interpret these paintings more deeply um, think that perhaps it could be understood that the empty chair refers to the father of the unborn child away on some mercantile business, which is alluded to by the map. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be fair. So this is Girl with the Pearl Earring, even without all the hoopla, it's perhaps Vermeer's most striking and beautiful image. The immediacy of it has an almost snapshot-like appearance, which there's an implied movement that is unusual in Vermeer's art in this picture. The girl has a radiant glow, her lips are parted, very sensual, the light reflected off her large pearl earring is remarkable, and her exotic costume is different than anything we've seen in his work. Vermeer here departed from his normal scheme of silhouetting his figures against a light wall and placed her against a plain dark background. Her features are so purified that it seems to be an idealized image rather than an actual portrait. The slightly blurred contour of her face has been achieved by extending a thin, flesh-colored glaze slightly over the dark background. In this work, Vermeer has avoided line almost completely. The eyes, lips, and nose have been modeled with gently modulated tones of paint. This contrasts with the more freely executed strokes that represent the light hitting her turban. And this turban, we don't know where it came from. It certainly has nothing to do with the fashion of Vermeer's day. It might be that she was meant to be a Sibyl, for instance. The art of painting in Vienna holds a special place within Vermeer's oeuvre. It stands apart in its imposing scale, 47 and a quarter by 39 and a half inches, and its pronounced allegorical character. It has in common with other works the carefully observed 17th century Dutch interior illuminated by softly diffused light, the exquisitely painted details, many known from others of his work, the map, the tapestry, the brass studded chair, we've seen them all before, and the fact that we're presented with a frozen moment imbued with psychological depth. We know this painting was personally significant to the artist. It remained in his possession until his death and was not sold even though the family was left in dire financial straits. The year after Vermeer's death, his wife transferred the ownership of the picture to her mother, Maria Tins, to keep the painting out of the hands of creditors. You see that it shows an artist at an easel depicting a woman as Cleo, Cleo, the muse of history. She's crowned with laurel, symbolizing honor, glory, and eternal life, and holds a trumpet, symbol of fame, and a volume of Thucydides, symbol of history. And as we've seen in the 17th century, history painting was viewed as the noblest category of subject matter in which artists demonstrated their knowledge and originality of thought. The artist in this case is shown from behind He's dressed in a doublet with slits across its back and arms, so it's a historicizing costume. It has nothing to do with 17th century dress. 
And you see these wonderful patterns that he tends to make. Here, the, the black jacket, red hose, white boot hose, and black slippers are almost abstract in their crisp renderings of light and shadow. Light models the worn surface of the wall map and reflects its aged appearance. And brilliant sunlight, captured with thick impostos of lead tin yellow, reflects off the polished surface of the brass chandelier. The elaborate tapestry curtain pulled to one side is a theatrical device. It draws attention to the scene as staged, and like we saw in The Girl in Dresden, it enhances the illusionism of the scene. The difference in scale between the artist and Cleo is reminiscent of that in Officer and Laughing Girl, and it's funny to think that if the artist were to stand up, he would tower over Cleo. Interest, this is interesting also in that it shows how an artist worked in the 17th century. He painted seated. It shows the use of his mall stick to steady his hand. That's, you see, you see that, yeah. Um, the canvas is first covered with a light gray ground, and the composition indicated with white lines that were probably chalk, like the chalk he used to indicate his orthogonal, orthogonals. The artist then applies flat, unmodulated strokes of color as the underlying tones for the laurel wreath, and at a later stage, he would apply a variety of glazes and small highlights to model the form. As seems to have been his standard practice, he marked his vanishing point, the pinhole just below the black finial of the pole weighing the map. So it's a wonderful view into Vermeer and the way that Vermeer would have constructed a picture, yet Vermeer is taken from us and placed with, replaced by an artist with his back to us in a historiating costume. I show you here the astronomer, which is in our exhibition, and the geographer, which is in Frankfurt, and they are allied to the art of painting in that the subjects feature men. And up until now, we've really been concentrating on women, and women do make up the largest part of Vermeer's oeuvre. Here we have contemplative gentlemen scholars. Men of standing were advised to be well-versed in both the arts and, scienti and sciences. Both rooms show that they are filled with equipment germane to their investigations, including a celestial globe in the astronomer and a terrestrial globe on the chest behind the geographer. Both men wear silk kimonos, luxurious articles of clothing used as house robes among the Dutch elite in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. So the question has arisen as to whether they were intended as pendants. Though they're nearly identical in size, the compositions are not complementary, the perspectival systems are out of sync with one another, and the color and lighting schemes diverge. So it's been suggested, and I think it's pretty convincing, that they were commissioned, first one and then the other, by Adrian Potts, a member of Rotterdam's town council and director of the city's chamber of the East India, Dutch East India Company. Certainly, the subjects were appropriate for someone who oversaw an enterprise in which navigation played such a fundamental role. This is Vermeer's last treatment of the letter writing theme. <clears throat> it's the lady writing a letter with her maid, the one that was stolen twice. Um, and the mistress for the first time in Vermeer's work is bent over her writing, absorbed in her task. And it's a very good example of Vermeer's late style, where the forms become increasingly stylized and abstracted. Here we have serenity combined with solemnity and grandeur. The maid is a solid, columnar form, immobile. Horizontals and verticals are emphasized by the large black frame on the back wall. And there's no interaction between the figures, unlike his other earlier works of mistresses and maids. For example, the one in the Frick collection in the middle, or the Rijksmuseum painting on the right, in which Vermeer is interested in the psychological reaction of the mistress to the unexpected arrival of a letter. 
The maid's glance out the window directs all attention away from the center of the picture. Perhaps the woman is writing to an absent loved one, maybe answering the slightly crumpled letter with its detached wax seal on the floor in front of the table. That's what you see down here. The figures are both occupied with their own thoughts and removed from one another and from us. Vermeer has used a more subdued palette where the strongest color note is where the carpet covering the table catches the light. He gives us another example of the pulled back curtain that defines the foremost plane of the painting. And on the back wall, you see a painting of the finding of Moses. This is the same painting that's on the back wall of the astronomer. And this is a painting that must have been owned by Vermeer possibly part of his stock as an art dealer. He uses a different painting technique now. Instead of complex layerings of opaque paints and glazes, here highlights and shadows do not overlap, but are laid down in adjacent predetermined areas. So we have these broad, flat areas of color, where you see also how schematically rendered the floor tiles are. The maid's broadly painted garments are so sharply defined in terms of light and shadow that they almost resemble the fluting on classical columns. The mistress's linen sleeves are so crisp that they seem almost brittle. The paint is now read as paint. The abstract painting technique keeps the viewer at a distance, unseduced now by the illusion of reality. As we've seen, artistic influences were fluid, and Vermeer was well aware of artistic developments, not only in Delft, but also elsewhere in the Dutch Republic, and an artist whose name is not on your sheet, but whose work I show you here on the left is Gerrit Dow, whose woman at the clavichord in the Dulwich Picture Gallery is a great example of the kind of work that was pioneered in Leiden by Dow and his student Franz von Miris. Um, this was, Leiden was really a center, and he, this, this is another uh, focal point of this exhibition that's going to happen soon, that try to untangle who was looking at whom in Dutch genre pictures. Vermeer's stylistic shift towards greater refinement that we've been looking at is best explained as response to these contemporary developments in Leiden. You see here that Vermeer's painting in London on the right and you see in the back of that painting, you see that's Bob Buren's Procurus, is indebted to Dow's earlier painting on the left, although the schematized execution, typical of Vermeer's late style, is distinctly different than Dow's painstaking yet flowing technique. And I draw your attention to two amazing paintings by Dow, who's one of my heroes in class distinctions. This is the lace maker in the Louvre, um, a very, very small work. It measures only nine and five eighths by eight and quarter inch. It's a traditional subject, and I and think back to the painting by Moss that we saw earlier in this lecture and that's in the exhibition. You see that she is intensely concentrated on her activity. There's an extreme focus on her face and hands, and she's placed against a blank wall. I remember going into New York, in a hotel in New York, in one of Ian Schrager's hotels, and he had taken this painting and blown it up, and it occupied the entire wall behind the bed. And the painting is really tiny, and it was a very bizarre dislocation. <laughs> um, because this, it, this concentration, it didn't lose concentration blown up, it was just weird. Um, <laughs> But he gives us here a low viewpoint that forces us to see not the technique, but the act of lace making. The crisp light effects and schematization of forms are typical of his late style as we've seen. And if you look closely, her nose and fingers are dramatically bisected by shadow and sunlight. Her elaborate coiffure is simplified. And the foreground elements are on the other hand, blurred and abstracted, with the threads seeming to ooze from the lace-making cushion. This is one of the most amazing little passages of painting in the 17th century. 
I compare Vermeer's Lace Maker to that by Caspar Netcher of 1664 in the Wallace Collection. This is a roughly contemporary painting by a student of Terborg, and it's charming. Um, it highlights domestic virtue and industry that we looked at, as does the Moss picture. And it gives us far more information about the number of bobbins required for the task and the arrangement of the pins, but it lacks the intensity of Vermeer's vision. Vermeer's subject matter was not so different from that of his contemporaries. His was not the role of innovator. His distinction lies in his appreciation of the possibilities inherent in subjects that had already been developed. He visualized a perfect world in a form so natural that it seems almost effortless. I hope I've convinced you otherwise, though. It's not effortless, and everything is highly structured. With single-minded dedication, he followed through each new type of image or composition to its most profound conclusion. He concentrated on one problem at a time, and his intensity of concentration, like that of his lace maker, engendered an unrivaled mastery. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. We ask that those of you who are leaving now, please do so as quietly as possible so we can start with the questions. If you have a question, raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. In the girl with the pearl earring, that pearl is the size of a baseball. Is that even remotely realistic? I have no idea. I, I, I think there are probably some amazing pearls that existed in the 17th century. I doubt, I, I doubt that this woman would have owned one or that Vermeer would have owned one. I'd like to have it, but... <laughs> are, are any of the men, or, or do you know if any of the women depicted are his wife? We don't know the, we, we don't know who any of these people is, I'm afraid. And in fact, you know, that was the, the, the Tracy Chevalier's flight of, fa of fancy that she made the maid servant greet as the girl with the pearl earring. We just, we have, we have almost no information about Vermeer, about his private life. How extensive do you think Vermeer used optics to, to create his compositions? As I said, I think he was very well aware of them. I don't think he traced an image because of what he viewed. I think that he and, and most of the artists in 17th century Holland were very aware of developments in optics. It was one of those scientific uh, advances that they were also very interested in. It's hard to see. In, in the list of paintings that you gave us, in the beginning, there's one religious theme, and near the very end, there's another religious theme. Why do you think that is? Why at the what beginning? What was the other one the, at the very end? What's the religious theme? Oh, the allegory of, uh, that was the allegory, allegory of Catholic of faith. the Catholic right, faith, yeah. yes. Um, what do you mean, what's the question again? Why only two, and why at the beginning and the end? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I know that he had converted to Catholicism. Um, both of those pictures are large. They could both have been made for one of these hidden Catholic churches, but it's all conjecture. But he remained a Catholic, and his, mother, his wife was Catholic, and his mother-in-law was Catholic, so he had access to the world of Catholicism. Um, considering he only painted a few paintings and very few people collected his work during his lifetime, 
how did he become well known? Going That's a great question. I mean, the, the vagaries of taste in Dutch painting is really interesting. He was completely unknown until Torre Berger discovered him, so-called discovered him in the middle of the 19th century. And, and when we look at the artists who were the most prized in their lifetime, somebody like Gerrit Dow was the most highly prized artist working in Holland in the 17th century. He, was, he had two people who paid for the right of first refusal of his works, and they're in all of the great royal collections in Europe. So when I bought the Dow that we have here, it was a coup because many Dows were taken a long time ago. In the 19th century, the appreciation for Rembrandt came up and the appreciation for somebody like Dow who was a consummate craftsman went down. So this idea of genius, lonely genius, um, was something that was anathema to a craftsman like Dow whose you know, fine painter technique was held up as the paradigm uh, to painters in 1641, and you know everybody was warned not to even try to paint like Dow, lest you uh, lest you go into a, a a stiff, lifeless kind of of image, and that if you look closely, this curious looseness of his brushwork is what astounded. You know, with one hair, he made this curious looseness of of uh, brushwork, and you can see that in the Frankfurt painting in the exhibition. But with this idea of a misunderstood genius who's, you know, Rembrandt went like this, Dow went like this. Where Vermeer came in, uh, there's this whole aura of mystery around him because we know nothing. And I think it lets people really make up whatever they want, as we've seen in contemporary literature. And when Jasmine asked me to talk about Vermeer, I said, really? Because <laughs> Vermeer is hard to talk about. I mean, you say that he, his images are beautiful. They're very carefully constructed. There's a magical stillness to them. What else do you say? <laughs> really? I mean, I'm hard pressed. I, try, I tried, but you know. Um, but what, why we respond the way we're responding now to him, I, I really have no idea, but I bet somebody's gonna write about it pretty soon. <laughs> This will be our last question. Uh, following up on that, who were the people who bought Vermeer's paintings? Who, who were his patrons at the time? As I said, there are two known people. We, we have the baker, and we have this guy, Van Rauven, who seems to have paid him for the right of first refusal. But there, we don't know anything more about where his paintings were. He was virtually unknown until the middle of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you, Ronnie. <laughs>